It is my distinct pleasure and my honor to introduce Mary Bruce Warlick, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. I think a lot of us in this room follow the fantastic products and the research that IEA does. So it's just an absolute honor to welcome you here with us today. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much uh, for the kind invitation. Um, I really want to say um, it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, I do really regret that I'm unable to join you in person in Istanbul. I would have loved to have been there, um, but I certainly very much appreciate the opportunity to say a few words and to share with you uh, my thoughts, our thoughts here at the IEA um, on the geopolitical challenges of the current global energy crisis and the implications for the clean energy transition. Um, there's no question um, in our view the crisis is clearly impacting all regions and all fuels. And while it is far from over, it is sowing the seeds for enduring changes in energy markets. Um, make no mistake, we are entering a new energy world. And with these shifts, we enter new geopolitical territory we see risks of geopolitical fractures around energy and climate and potential new dividing lines between advanced and emerging and developing economies. And the crisis is clearly affecting all countries, but we're particularly concerned about the effects of soaring energy prices in the developing world where people can least afford it. High energy prices have set back progress towards achieving affordable access to energy and um, is contributing to a sharp increase in extreme poverty in the most vulnerable countries and communities. In Africa, the IEA estimates the number of people living without electricity increased by 16 million or 3% between 2019 and 2021, reversing almost all the gains made over the previous five years. And this dire trend is set to be reinforced in 2022. And it's not only an energy crisis. Many countries also face a food security crisis and increasingly visible impacts of climate change. Now, developing countries have limited means to pay for the measures needed to reach universal access to modern energy, improve resilience to future energy shocks, and benefit from emerging clean energy technologies. We see a disparity already. The IEA's Sustainable Recovery Tracker shows advanced economies mobilizing over 10 times the recovery spending that emerging market and developing economies have dedicated to clean energy since the start of the pandemic. And virtually all of the fiscal measures that have been taken to cushion the impact of high prices on households are concentrated in advanced market economies. And the longer basic energy services remain out of reach for millions, the deeper will be new fissures may, that uh, may grow over climate action. Investment in clean energy transitions is another potential source of geopolitical fragmentation. And such investment is still well below the level needed to bring emissions down if we are to keep net zero and sustainable development goals in sight. The 1.4 trillion that we expect the world to spend on energy transitions in 2022 would need to rise to well over 4 trillion by 2030 to get us on track in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees while also ensuring sufficient energy supply. The good news, however, is that investment in clean energy transitions is finally picking up. In the five years following the 2015 Paris Agreement, clean energy investment grew by only 2% per year. But since 2020, this rate has risen to 12% per year, led by increased spending on solar and wind power including a record year for offshore wind in 2021. However, this investment is concentrated in advanced economies and China, while many emerging and developing economies, particularly in Africa, are still unable to attract the 
clean energy investments and the financing they need. Excluding China, clean energy spending in emerging and developing economies is stuck at 2015 uh, levels, which means it hasn't increased since the Paris Agreement was reached. And while falling clean technology costs mean that this money goes further than it used to, um, the overall amount, around $150 billion a year, remains well short of what is needed to meet rising energy demand in developing economies in a sustainable way. It is an area where international financial organizations and international development institutions have major roles to play, including through the provision of concessional finance. But against this background, the energy investment gap between advanced economies and the emerging and developing world continues to be a major fault line in global efforts to meet shared energy and climate goals. And there is no doubt an urgent need to develop and articulate a clear vision and to establish the support of policy and regulatory environments that can mobilize private capital in emerging and developing economies. Issues include subsidies that tilt the playing field against sustainable investments, lengthy procedures for licensing and land acquisition, restrictions on foreign direct investment, currency risks, and limited liquidity in local banking and capital markets. And keeping the cost of capital low is also critical to international efforts to accelerate inflows of private capital. In the developing world, the cost of capital can be up to seven times higher than in advanced economies. This gap reflects real and perceived risks about investment projects. When the cost of capital is high, it stifles the availability of capital and makes energy transitions much more expensive. Why the cost of capital varies so much by geography and project is not well understood, but part of the explanation is low transparency. So to shine a brighter light on capital costs in emerging and developing economies, the IEA, together with the WEF and other partners, have developed um, fairly recently a cost of capital observatory. The observatory is hosted on the IEA website, and it was launched just a few weeks ago um, in Pittsburgh um, in connection with the Clean Energy Ministerial. We really hope the observatory will help drive policy changes that will lower financing costs in the parts of the world that most need it. And in an upcoming IEA analysis, we estimate that if financing costs were to drop by 200 basis points in emerging and developing economies, it would reduce the investment requirements for clean energy, including financing costs, by a cumulative $16 trillion over the period to 2050 in the net zero emission scenario. Now, this is a huge prize that should be a central focus for governments, project developers, and financial institutions. Diametrically opposed views are sometimes a telltale sign of geopolitical fragmentation within or between nations. And a hint of this in the wake of today's energy crisis has given rise to a false narrative that this is not the time to be investing in clean energy. In our view, this could not be further from the truth. We do not have to choose between responding to today's energy crisis and tackling the climate crisis. Not only can we do both, we must do both because they are intimately linked. Massive investment in clean energy is the best guarantee of energy security in the future and it will also drive down harmful greenhouse gas emissions. Now we fully recognize that the energy crisis is still far from over, and there are some very tough challenges ahead, no doubt, especially this winter. But as the IEA's executive director, Fatih Birol, has repeatedly said in recent weeks, Russia is not winning the energy war, and efforts to tackle climate change are not doomed. In fact, Russia may be sowing the seeds for a faster exodus from fossil fuels. In addition, we believe that there's a good basis for some legitimate optimism if we look beyond the immediate crisis. With supportive policies and the right investment decisions, this crisis can become a historic turning point 
towards a cleaner and more secure energy future. We are already seeing encouraging signs um, and steps in this direction with some major policy announcements from around the world, such as those included in the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which will boost a huge array of clean energy technologies from solar, wind, and electric vehicles to carbon capture and hydrogen, with 370 billion in potential investments that will mobilize far larger sums from the private sector. And the Repower EU plan, in line with the Fit for 55 plan, sets out how the European Union can reduce reliance on re Russian natural gas through energy savings, diversification of energy supplies, and an accelerated rollout of renewable energy. Moreover, the uh, Japan's Green Transformation Initiative uh, and the growth of renewables in China, India, and beyond are additional important policy um, uh, initiatives. Now, the governments and businesses who invest early and wisely in this new global energy economy stand to reap the benefits and can certainly lead the way. Um, but as I said at the outset, these shifts also bring us into new geopolitical territory. And navigating these waters requires an unerring focus uh, on cooperation without forsaking the benefits of fair competition and a renewed focus on multilateralism to ensure we move toward a more secure, accessible and clean energy future. So I really want to thank you once again um, for the opportunity to speak with you, albeit virtually today. Um, I do hope to have an opportunity to join in person at a future um, Atlantic Council event. I um, really want to thank you for taking the initiative for this important discussion today and wish you fruitful discussions and the very best for the remainder of this important conference. Thank you.